Hello everyone, this is Ross and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables and how to use all that stuff in the kitchen, how to grow it, and uh, really just to enjoy the experience of eating your own food. So in this episode, it's largely inspired by um, someone I've been doing some consulting work for. His name's John. And um, John's a super nice guy, and uh, he's really passionate about growing different foods and uh, different crops. And he's pretty new at this. Um, so unfortunately, he's fallen into like a little bit of a trap. I fell into this trap myself, um, where you kind of just want to grow everything you can, and especially the really difficult stuff that you really can't grow in, uh, in a large part of the United States. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today is kind of like sort of how to avoid growing the wrong fruits or, and if you are going to grow these really tropical fruits, then you're going to need specific conditions. And we're going to talk about those conditions in a bit. Um, so I guess the first really great source of information here, which I didn't even know, I had this entire time had kind of sort of thought this was the, I guess, the opposite. Um, here we have an EDU website here, University of Florida, and they have a list of temperate fruits. And this is not a full list, I'm sure, because there's so many fruits out there. Um, but then they also have lists of subtropical fruits and tropical fruits. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, a fig is a subtropical fruit. The jujube is a subtropical fruit. I guess it kind of comes down to who's classifying these things. Then I went to a different website, Daly's in um, Daly's Nursery in Australia. They're a really big and popular and well-respected nursery in Australia, and they actually have the fig listed as a temperate fruit as well. So I guess it sort of depends on what you're looking at, um, but it makes a lot of sense that you know, these these fruits like the fig, like the pomegranate, like the jujube, like the persimmon, you know, that I would have considered subtropical, it makes sense that they could also be temperate. You know, it's, I'm not going to lose my mind over uh, a simple classification, but um, this is a great starting point. And this is why I'm kind of talking about it, is that you really should pay attention to what is temperate or what is subtropical. Um, and less so what is subtropical because, you know, if you look at all the subtropical fruits, if you look at, um, really all the fruits that exist that you can grow, there's a pretty limited amount of them that you guys can grow in the United States. Like I was saying in the beginning of this video, um, you know, there really isn't anywhere in the U S except for Southern Florida that you could say is tropical. You could say that, um, and you could grow a lot of very tropical-ish ish fruits in like Arizona and probably maybe in the south part of Texas and different parts of Florida, not just the southern part, part but also in Southern California. Um, there is some places that you could do this, but that's this really small area uh, that you, this is possible, you know, and mostly they're pretty coastal areas. Um, you know, certainly the further south you go towards that equator, you're going to get closer to that rainforest, to that tropical environment. Um, so that's where all these fruits that people are trying to grow, especially the new growers, that's where they're all from. And depending on where these things grew up, even just like something as simple as kale, let's take, you know, kale, I don't know where it comes from originally, but I'm sure it came from a very cold place and that's why it's so well adapted to the cold and that's why you're supposed to grow it in colder climates and if you're in a climate with a warm summer you can only really grow it um, in the spring or in the fall um, maybe even in the winter time depending on where you live so um, you know everything has its own little um, adaptation and depending on where it grew up where it adapted that's going to largely determine where these things can grow with ease. And this is kind of where I think a lot of people 
get a bit confused because that statement right there wasn't exactly clicked in their head, right? Like, you know, you could hear that. I'm sure John, myself, uh, other people who kind of get this bug and they're like, oh, I want to grow every tropical fruit I can, I can get. And you know it's going to be difficult. But a lot of people give up after the first year, the second year, the third year. Um, first off, we're too quick to give up. But the second point here is that we just ignore advice. We ignore the um, – we didn't really understand to what extent those tropical fruits were going to be so difficult to grow in these conditions, right? It wasn't something we understood. It wasn't something that people talk about. It's not something that's easy to find. This information, and I'm telling you right now, uh, how many times has someone sat down and they put this information in front of you? It's pretty rare. Um, there is, however, a tropical fruit forum, and this is kind of one forum that I just want to plug. I don't know too many people here, but I have talked about citrus and tried to learn about citrus in the citrus uh, discussion here. There is some people that, you know, I, I do know actually that are part of different communities and they're also a part of this community. So it's kind of like a big, you know, big group of people that kind of cross over into different um, different forums. But uh, I'm sure it's a nice community filled with nice people um, and they really know their stuff. You know, there's always somebody out there, guys, who's got all the mulberries, who's got all the figs, who's got all the pomegranates, who's got all the weird fruits that you wouldn't even think of you know there's some guy that's doing this or some woman who's doing this um you know it just uh it's it's kind of crazy to think about but if you can get a hold of that person and ask them some questions um hopefully they're they have enough time to respond to you uh you will be really way ahead of the game um, you know, if I could talk to Pons right now, I'm sure I could learn quite a bit. I'm sure all of us could uh, on on the topic of regarding figs. So, um, you know, it's just something that I think is really worth checking out. These online communities, people really know what they're doing, been doing this for years. So what I would do if I was really starting to think about what fruits to grow, I would really carefully consider all the tempered fruits and I'm talking about even the weird ones that are not even on this list you know you're, you're thinking about you're talking about like elderberry and gumi and currants and honeyberries and things we've talked about in other episodes of fruit talk and um, you know I would consider all that and I would try to taste some of these fruits if possible like quince as an example quince is not really going to be something that's good fresh but it's going to make the best jam uh, a lot of people really think it has some of the best jam um, so try to find yourself some quince jam as an example before you think about growing it you you know uh, try to do as much research as humanly possible because this is going to be the stuff that's supposed to be easy to grow and in all honesty some of it can be quite challenging so I would just suggest that check that out go through these lists type in you know what temperate fruits do you want to you want to grow and then I would start thinking about once you've got a handle on a number of these things, then I would go into the subtropical fruit list and say, all right, well, can I grow an avocado? Can I grow a banana? Can I grow some coffee? Is it going to be worth it? Am I going to get enough fruits here that I'm actually going to be able to say, wow, this was totally worth it? Am I, what, what are the requirements of all this? And certainly in at least my part of the country, uh, my part of the world, or somewhere where you're not in a tropical-ish location or like a zone 10, a really warm zone 9. If you're not in either one of those, if you don't ha if you have any frost whatsoever, you are going to have to grow these things in pots. And here's where the, the tricky part comes in, is that because you're growing them in pots, you have to move them, of course, you have to move them out um, out of the cold so you have to put them in some kind of environment maybe a greenhouse maybe your home in a window uh, maybe you just overwinter them um, in the dark in total darkness um, like bananas people do that with bananas 
Um, you can come up with a number of strategies, but the that's the big issue here is that what do you do with these things um, come the when it gets cold? Um, you know, if you can see, you probably can see over here behind me is a citrus tree. And this thing is, of course, not going to survive outside. It can take a, a pretty late frost, but that's it. You know, we're getting down to zero degrees Fahrenheit. It's not going to survive. So I got to bring it inside and I got to take care of it. And there's a bit, really big risk of this thing dying in the wintertime. It happens all the time. We overwater our trees, especially indoors. There's all kinds of pest issues. Um, there's a lack of sunlight. You know, these are evergreen trees. So they're going to have leaves and trying to get as much photosynthesis as possible. And they get to the state where, first off, it's going to be too cold in your house because these trees, they have a certain optimal temperature. Just like us, we operate. I don't know what temperature we operate. I always forget. Bugs. They love the warm weather, right? That's why they're so active. They're cold-blooded insects. Dinosaurs, as an example, would do the same thing. You know, um, these plants, these subtropical trees, or these trees that really love warmer conditions need a warmer environment. If they don't have a warmer soil temperature, they don't do anything. They really don't do anything. In fact, the citrus trees are so difficult to deal with because if it's cold, then the water just sits there in the pot and they don't up uptake that water uh, nearly as quickly and you get root rot. And if you get root rot, your tree defoliates. So your trees are really in a decline almost all winter time. It really is a bit of a challenge. Um, so that's my big, that's like the biggest worry right there is that you gotta bring them inside. First off, again, they're, they're not gonna have the right temperature. They're going to be a in a decline. Um, yeah, so that's that's one big requirement. Then also, because they are evergreen, they don't have a dormancy period, you really need to feed them more than deciduous trees. They're heavy feeders, uh, most of them anyway. Um, you know, they're in that state of like limbo where they're either slightly in an uptrend or slightly in a downtrend. Or they're just flatlining the whole time and you're like all right well you know what do I do to get this thing out of it and the only thing really you can help it through is to have the right amount of moisture in the soil and also the right amount of heat and the right amount of food if you really food you really feed these things it's really important every single winter time with all these sub, with all these subtropical or tropical trees, we got to be feeding them even throughout the winter time, and we forget. We really do. Um, so that's a big one. I would say even just during the growing season, be feeding them more than than your deciduous trees. So um, that's that's a big important point here that I think a lot of people miss. There, you know, and also the fact that they're in a container. You have to feed them a lot to begin with. You know, my potted figs as an example, if I don't feed them, they'll do nothing all year. They literally will do nothing. They'll grow, they'll put on some leaves. That's it. Um, it doesn't matter how much worm castings and, you know, good soil I have. If I don't give them some kind of high nitrogen, you know, a good amount of phosphorus and potassium, they're not going to really do much for me. Um, so, you know, uh, it's just a simple fact that they're in a pot. If they're in the ground, I don't feed them at all. But, you know, you only have so much nutrients in a pot. You only have so much soil. We have to be feeding them more, and especially because they're not deciduous. They're evergreen. They're heavier feeders. It's a big deal. The other big thing here is that we need to be considering our humidity level. A lot, a lot of people... Uh, swear, and I don't know the exact humidity levels that all these tropical fruits need, right? I'm not going to pretend like I know because I, I really don't. I haven't grown most of these fruits before. You know, I've been growing a lot of these um, these citrus trees for a while, about four or five years now. I grew a mango at one point. I had a different types of um, different types of sapotes. Um, I have some tea plants. I guess that's supposed to be quite tropical. 
Uh, let's see here. Let's go back to the subtropical list. So I had a, uh, I thought about growing bananas and avocados, and then I realized here's the big thing with those is that they need to have a really big pot, a ton of nutrients. By the time they fruit, the banana dies first off after it fruits. You have to start all over again. It takes three years to get fruit. Then your, your avocado is the same thing, three years minimum to get fruit. You have to have two varieties to cross pollinate each other. Has to have a big pot, lots of nutrients. And then by the time they get root bound, after about year three, they are in the decline and then they start to die. Um, avocados really don't like um, the incorrect soil moisture, things messing around with their roots. So you really are just kind of wasting your time with a lot of this stuff. But in terms of humidity, there's a lot of this that loves that humidity. My right, citrus hasn't really uh, been affected too much although in drier conditions we start to get spider mites they love the drier conditions and that really affects the citrus tree I've seen that decimate them one year um, so it's pretty important um, to consider all this now there's a whole other thing we, we didn't even mention is the sunlight what are the sunlight requirements? Because we don't have as strong of a sun. We don't have as many daylight hours. We have a different color temperature. We have different nutrients that the sun is giving the plants. Um, or different um, photosynthesis, I should say. So it's pretty, it's pretty crazy, right? It's really nuts. Um, you know, it's really just, uh, it's a big issue. And if you don't have enough hours of light, it's going to take you much longer to get fruit. Then when you get the fruit, it's going to take you even longer to ripen the fruit because you don't have enough energy. You don't have enough photosynthesis. So um, that's one thing I think a lot of people totally just neglect. And that's probably the biggest one is the, the lack of sunlight. Um you know, a lot of fruit trees won't even fruit if you don't have enough sun. They won't fruit at all. Even the temperate fruits that we can grow here. So uh, it's pretty, um, I think a lot of people are asking for quite a bit when they're into some of these things. I would say from my own personal experience, the citrus are relatively easy. <laughs> I think that's the one tropical fruit that I've come across so far that seems to be worth it the most first off it's really tasty you're gonna have you're gonna really struggle although to grow sweeter citrus you may have to stick with uh, you know sour citrus like limes and lemons um, things like that but I find that they're really worth growing um, I'm sure there's some others like the sapodilla it's supposed to be really good for uh, doing this kind of thing and the white sapote people have had success with mangoes and uh, even lychees and loquats and longin um, I had all those different things at one point and then I ended up killing them in the in the greenhouse one year um, bananas are supposed to be relatively easy it's just that they take a long time they need a lot of food um, you know there's a lot of these things here that are very very difficult the Barbados cherry is the same thing that some of these things can actually fruit like the Jabota Kaba they can fruit stay young stay small um, and actually put out a lot of fruit you know it's not like a jackfruit here which needs to be you know a giant tree before it puts out any fruit um, you know let's see here what else are we going over um, yeah, so that's mostly it in terms of what's on these lists. So you're, you're really kind of limited here in what you can even try, I would say. You know, I really did some research a few years ago thinking about, all right, well, what can I grow? And it seems like to me it's just better to stick with things that um, are temperate, you know, or are on the edge of temperate and subtropical, like figs and plum or and, uh, persimmons, I'm sorry, and pomegranates and jujubes. You know, these are really where the, the money's at here and the experiences and, and enjoying a lot of these fruits because you can grow them here. 
Um, in fact, I would argue that the fig is actually kind of easy to grow in this part of the world. It's easy to grow, but it's, uh, you know, the fruit quality, unfortunately, suffers big time with humidity and the, and the rain. So, you know, uh, that's just my big lesson here, guys. I hope you, uh, you got something out of this. You enjoyed this. I don't mean to discourage anybody, but I would do some research and I would, um, if you're gung ho on this whole thing, let's say this, we'll end with this is that don't give up. Yeah. I mean, that's really the whole message of this episode is that either don't do it at all or don't give up. I think that's, that's a great lesson because you're just going to end up spending all this time for what, for nothing. If you're going to give up, um, you know, uh, you got a learning experience out of it. So I guess that's what you paid for. But at the end of the day, you're probably spending quite a bit of money to get this working and, uh, it's just not. So that's what I'd recommend to you guys is to do your research, really put in it all the time that you need to get this, all this stuff working out for you and you'll be a lot more happy. So, all right, guys, uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Hopefully we have a different studio, a different setup here because uh, I'm sure this wasn't ideal for everybody. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, guys.